Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Virginia Breast Health Equity Summit. I'm Reba Hollingsworth, morning anchor here at CBS 6. It is so good to see all of you virtually and honored. I am so honored to facilitate this conversation again today. There will be a Q&A portion during uh, this, um, this hour we're with you. So if you have a question, just please feel free to put your question in the chat box and we'll try our very best to get it answered for you. And this is definitely a very important topic. Focusing on health equity is not new to the American Cancer Society. In fact, it is embedded in almost everything that we do. We are hosting the second annual Virtual Breast Health Equity Summit in Virginia to educate and influence our communities to bring about meaningful, sustainable change across the breast cancer continuum. This year, we are highlighting the impact breast cancer screening has in Virginia and the need to close the gaps for marginalized individuals. The Breast Health Equity Summit is an annual opportunity to bring communities together on this very important issue. The COVID-19 pandemic has really brought to light these disparities among our most vulnerable populations. Cancer is a disease that affects everyone, but does not affect everyone equally. Health disparities adversely affect different groups of people. CBS 6 and the American Cancer Society are proud to host the second annual Breast Health Equity Summit to further explore health equity and screenings across Virginia. And again, I want to say welcome and thank you for joining us. And we also want to give a special thank you to our sponsors today, our gold sponsors, DuPont and Dominion Energy. Our silver sponsors, Riverside Cancer Care Network and Humana, and our bronze sponsor, Carillion Clinic, and the media sponsor, again, WTVR CBS 6. Now we'd like to kind of kick off our conversation today. Our first presenter is Regay King, Senior Director of Cancer Control for the American Cancer Society. Hi, Regay. Hi, Reba. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. I am Regay King, Senior Director of Cancer Control Strategic Partnerships for the American Cancer Society, and I am so excited to have you join us for the American Cancer Society's second annual Virginia Breast Health Equity Summit. And as you heard Reba say, last year we came together during the same time period to discuss breast health equity in the state of Virginia. I would be remiss if I did not take the time to paint the picture of the current burden of breast cancer here in our Commonwealth. Unfortunately, about 7,400 women are diagnosed each year in the Commonwealth for breast cancer. And unfortunately, each year we lose approximately 1,200 women in the Commonwealth. But let me share some exciting news, some good news. Mammography has made a tremendous impact for women here in the Commonwealth. It is estimated that there has been a decrease of about 41% in breast cancer mortality since 1989. And it's been because of that widespread use of mammography. One, as Reba mentioned earlier, unfortunately, COVID-19 has had an impact on screening and specifically on breast cancer screening. It is estimated in the three-month period of the shutdown that approximately 7.2 million mammograms did not take place. That means women either delayed their screening or did not screen at all during the year of 2020. And we expect to see some long-term impacts as a result of the pandemic. So what is the American Cancer Society doing in response to the pandemic and the decrease in screening? We kicked off a campaign at the end of 2020, our back to screening campaign with a strong message of getting screened. We've embarked on a learning collaborative, working with health systems to set goals to increase screening rates to pre-pandemic levels. However, we still continue to see a disparity here in Virginia as we do across the United States, where the breast cancer death rate is 40% higher for black women versus white women in our Commonwealth. And unfortunately, Latina women in our state are being diagnosed with a later stage disease as compared to white women. So what are some of the factors that lead to these disparities in breast cancer outcomes? And there are many. 
lack of medical coverage. Despite the fact that our state has passed Medicaid increase in screening, um, all screening, but specifically breast cancer screening, there is a barrier as far as early detection, and that can be geography, lack of resources. There is an unequal access to treatment improvements and navigation support. So while there are wonderful treatment guidelines, it may be that those guidelines are not being followed equally across the Commonwealth. We also need to ensure that there's access to quality care and unfortunately, there is discrimination in health care that can lead to barriers to care. So I would like to share some of the successes of the American Cancer Society long term as far as breast cancer. We were the first to demonstrate the safety and efficacy of mammograms for early detection. And we've invested over $68 million in breast cancer research grants one of those grants leading to the development of tamoxifen and another leading to the development of Herceptin. We have an exciting program scheduled for you today, but I leave you with these words. The money a person makes, the color of their skin, their sexual orientation, gender identity, disability status, or where they live shouldn't affect how they're impacted by breast cancer. The rest of our program is going to be sharing wonderful resources here in the Commonwealth for breast cancer screening and the wonderful work that some of our health system partners have undertaken to address this important disease. Thank you, Reba, for the opportunity to welcome everyone to our second annual Breast Health Equity Summit. Thank you, Riga. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for all the work that you do. We appreciate that. The American Cancer Society's sister organization, the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, works diligently every day to help pass new legislation and to keep funding for current legislation to help cancer patients. Now, one of the programs that we continually fight to protect is the CDC's National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program. It is NBCCEDP, and that's Every Woman's Life Program. Here today to tell us more is Heidi Miller, and Heidi has been an oncology nurse for the entirety of her 14-year nursing career. She has experience in all aspects of oncology, including inpatient, outpatient, academic, and community, as well as research settings. She is now Every Woman's Life Clinical Coordinator with Virginia Department of Health, and here to share some valuable information with us about this program. And Heidi, I'm going to put on my um, reporter hat now and ask you a series of questions here. So what <laughs> is the NBCCEDP and how did it get started and how is it going now? So the National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program, or NBCCEDP, as you said, was established in 1990 when Congress passed the Breast and Cervical Cancer Mortality Prevention Act. In about 1991, those funds started to be awarded, and by 1997, the NBCCEDP achieved nationwide coverage. 1997 also happens to be the year that Virginia was awarded its first funds through the program and created Every Woman's Life. Um, in 2000, Congress passed the Breast and Cervical Cancer Prevention Treatment Act, which allows individuals that were screened in the program to be enrolled into Medicaid to cover the cost of treatment. Um, as of 2017, the NBCC EDP has about 70 awardees, not about, has 70 awardees, um, all 50 states, D.C., six territories, and 13 tribes or tribal organizations. And today, our current focus is the ongoing changes in the healthcare environment, um, especially getting people back to cancer screening, as Rigay mentioned. The pandemic has caused major delays, and we fear the repercussions that will come of it down the road. Mm -hmm. Well, Heidi, can you tell me how many lives you think has been touched by this program? So nationally, the NBCC EDP has provided more than 15.4 million breast and cervical cancer screening tests and diagnosed more than 78,000 breast and cervical cancers over its 30 years. And in who is, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. And in Virginia specifically, our Every Woman's Life program has provided more than 184,000 screening tests 
and diagnose more than 4,000 cancers. So we have women that come back to us year after year to stay up to date on their life-saving screenings. Those are incredible numbers that you mentioned. Who is eligible for this program and what services does the, the program offer? So in regards to eligibility, um, female gender individuals, including those that are transgender, um, between the ages of 18 and 64, uninsured Virginia residents, and Virginia residents just means you have an address here. Um, we don't have a length of time that you're required to have been here. And at or below the 250% uh, of the federal poverty level. So to put that in perspective, one person household working full time can make $15.48 an hour and still qualify for our program. And if there's ever a question on eligibility, we're always happy to field those questions. And if we can't help you, we will find someone who can help you. Um, in regards to services, we cover just about everything that you can think of that you would need to get to a cancer diagnosis if one's going to be made, of course. Um, we do a lot of client education and case management, and we hold your hand and guide you through the process. The healthcare system can be a, a tangled web sometimes, and that's hard to get to where you need to be. Um, so specifically, we cover breast exams, mammograms, screening MRIs, pap tests, HPV tests, and any other diagnostics to get to that diagnosis point. And the most important thing we do is we also provide that means to access Medicaid. Um, EWO clients that are diagnosed with cancer or pre-cancer through the program are entitled to the full Virginia Medicaid via an expedited process. So we get them there and we get them treated quickly. And Heidi, for someone who may be watching us this afternoon and may be interested in the program, how do they get connected with the programs? So we currently have over 24 provider sites and growing across the state. So we cover just about every corner of the state. Um, if you go to our website, there's an interactive map. And on that map, you can click the specific county where you reside and it will show you um, exactly who the coordinator is and where you can go and give you a phone number to call to get connected. And then we also, of course, have a main phone line and an email address that anyone is free to reach out to us at for more information. Thank you, Heidi. We appreciate that presentation. Thank you so much. Well, Thank next you. on our panel is Dr. Emily Bellavance from Virginia Cancer Institute of Bon Secours at Southside Medical Center. Dr. Bellavance is a certified surgical oncologist specializing in the treatment of benign and malignant breast disease. Today, she is addressing breast health equity of the Crater Health District in South Central Virginia. Here's Dr. Bellavance. So what I'd like to do is go over a little bit of background about breast cancer and breast cancer specifically um, with underserved populations. And then we can talk a little bit about interventions we can do to help manage um, that disparity. So breast cancer is exceedingly common in the United States. Uh, it's the most common breast cancer diagnosed in women in the United States. And there will be approximately 280,000 cases diagnosed in 2021. And this translates to about a one in eight chance of developing breast cancer for all women with a lifetime risk of about 12.5%. So many women will either have personal experience with this or know someone in their neighborhood, a family member, or a friend who has experienced breast cancer. It is the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States. Um, fortunately, the majority of breast cancers will present early um, and therefore will be curable. However, we still have a significant mortality um, from breast cancer. Luckily, there have been some major improvements in our outcomes in the past 30 years. In many cancers, but specifically for breast cancer, we see a decrease in breast cancer deaths by 39% from 1989 to 2015. And this translates to about 320,000 averted deaths. This is largely due to improvements in detection, so diagnosing the cancer at an earlier stage with improved screening modalities, as well as treatment. And um, although I'm a breast surgeon and would like to say that this is mostly due to our type of surgery, that treatment advances that have 
significantly affected our our higher survival rates are actually due to um, advances in our adjuvant therapy. So advances in our radiation treatment modalities and advances in our systemic therapies that the medical oncologists provide. Unfortunately, these um, survival uh, advantages have not really translated equally among all groups. And you can see here from the CDC's National Center for Health Statistics, this is a graph looking at the gains in survival uh, seen between African Americans or black patients compared to white patients. Um, and you can see in the top, in the top graph that our gains seen in our white patients with um, a decrease in deaths from breast cancer is much higher um, when compared to their black counterparts. And this is particularly true for um, the age range most commonly diagnosed with um, breast cancer, which is women at the age of 50 and over. Similarly, we see differences in our survival outcomes when we look at socioeconomic status. So in red, you see our breast cancer death rates in uh, a poorer patient population is much higher compared to those in yellow in the high income patient population. Although there have been some improvements with our Medicare Part D expansion, which is shown in the solid line compared to the dotted line. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic is going to further exacerbate these outcomes. And this is going to include reduced access to care due to fear of infection, reallocation of healthcare resources, financial stressors such as unemployment um, and financial hardship in patients. And there have also been periods where our certain portions of our healthcare have been shut down, such as with screening. So this is going to delay both routine care and our um, ability to administer treatment. So certainly our screening rates went down um, earlier in the pandemic, and this is going to result in a later stage of diagnosis with a lower prob probability of survival. And certainly some of our treatments during the worst times of the pandemic were delayed. So sometimes we couldn't always do the surgeries that we wanted to do. And there was also a time period when our research, our ability to continue patients on our clinical trials, or at least enroll them on clinical trials was hindered because that was um, considered to increase some unnecessary in-person visits. And of course, these types of stressors are going to, again, affect the most vulnerable people in our population, such as those already um, already suffering from, from a lower socioeconomic status. So um, early on, there are actually uh, some publications using mathematical models to predict how this is going to affect some of our screen, screenable cancers. And this is a publication from the head of the NCI that uses one of those model, models specifically focusing on breast and colon cancer for which we have um, very uh, excellent screening modalities. And just based on the decreased screening, there will be a predicted um, 10,000 excess deaths from colon and breast cancer um, over the course of 2020 and 2030. Now, the incidence rates for breast cancer in our region and the Petersburg region and Crater Health District are particularly high when you compare them to the rest of Virginia. So we're in that red area delineated by the black arrow, and that indicates that we have a particularly high rate of breast cancer, about 135 to 148 cases per 100,000 uh, people. Unfortunately, we also have an increased um, death rate from breast cancer. Um, again, we see ourselves in the red with that higher rate of breast cancer related deaths compared to the rest of Virginia. And unsurprisingly, patients in the Crater Health District will present with more advanced disease at initial diagnosis. So we see on screen left, 
um, a lower proportion of patients in this district are presenting with local disease, which is, de which is defined as breast cancer confined to the breast. And this would be compared to the rest of Virginia in blue. And we see higher rates of patients presenting with regional disease, which means the breast cancer has started in the breast, but already has spread to the um, draining lymph node basins. And unfortunately, we also see higher numbers of distant disease, which means the breast cancer has spread beyond the breast and the lymph nodes to other organs in the body. And this is um, just a representative um, profile of the Petersburg area, and we can see there are many risk factors for poor outcomes in breast cancer patients, including a greater proportion of residents living below the poverty level compared to the state as a whole, a greater proportion of residents having public health insurance as opposed to private health insurance when we compare this to the Virginia population as a whole, a larger proportion of the residents living um, with a uh, lower household income, median household income, and a higher unemployment rate. And if we look at the literature um, showing um, those at risk for um, um, poor outcomes due to health disparities, we see that race, socioeconomic, health literacy, and access um, play a role and these discrepancies with outcome. So to start with race, Black and African-American women have a similar or lower incidence of breast cancer versus white women. But depending on the time period you look at, we see data showing a 30 or even up to 40, that they are 30 or even up to 40% more likely to die of breast cancer. Um, black women are more likely to be diagnosed at a younger age with breast cancer. And they are more likely to have triple negative disease compared to their white counterparts. Triple negative disease is a type of breast cancer that has been more aggressive than those breast cancers that respond to um, hormonal therapy. And there has been a lot of research in this area. Um, and certainly one of the factors that plays a role in this, since we see an independent, independently poor outcomes with race, with race is of course systemic racism. And there have also been publications demonstrating provider bias can affect our treatment recommendations. Socioeconomic status has also been shown to um, result in poor outcomes with breast cancer treatment. As I mentioned before, insurance can play a role. So patients with public insurance are more likely to have poor outcomes than those patients with private insurance. And certainly this is even more so true with patients without insurance or who are underinsured. Our overall health is significantly affected by our socioeconomic status, and this can affect cancer outcomes, and this can include access to healthy foods. We've all heard about food deserts in um, neighborhoods without access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, you can imagine there are decreased opportunities for exercise. And this can either do, be due to perhaps the neighborhood you live in, or it could be due to the fact that you're working two jobs and it's just not going to be a priority to spend an hour exercising when you have too many other responsibilities. Um, similarly, there can be competing survival priorities. Um, and this can include the financial burden or the inability to get time off from work. Um, the out-of-pocket cost for cancer treatment can be extremely high. And this has definitely been shown to affect patients' ability to adhere to treatment recommendations. And of course, there are competing stressors. So for example, I remember having a patient who had three young children, and she received an eviction notice at the same time she had her cancer diagnosis. So you can imagine what took priority in that situation, and appropriately so. Health literacy has also been shown to affect the outcomes, and this is not just the ability to understand and process information about prevention, screening, and treatment, but also just access to information that is digestible. Um, we can't give patients um, we can't give patients information that we would give another doctor that would be unrealistic. That would be like a mechanic trying to talk to me 
as if I also were a mechanic. I would understand, I wouldn't be able to, to follow you know, the jargon. Um, so we need to make sure our patients have access to information that is easily digestible. And of course, just access to both specialized and preventative healthcare. And this could just be due to distance to a healthcare provider or uh, an area where um, there's a, a paucity of, of medical providers in that area. It could be simple transportation issues in terms of, of um, inability to pay for the transportation or not enough access to public transportation. All right, thank you, Dr. Bella Vance. Now, Dr. Bella Vance is gonna to try to join us live for the Q&A portion. Right now she is in surgery, so again, she hopes to join us live. And just a reminder, if you have a question for anyone on the panel, make sure you just put it in the chat section and we're gonna to try to get it answered for you. So our, our next presentation, we have a duo presentation for Ballot Health. Paula Masters, Vice President for Health Programs and Department of Population Health at Ballot Health and joins us today. She has responsibility for development and implementation of many community and social health program services, such as the Faith Community Nurse Program, mobile health, including mobile COVID vaccination, community health worker programs, CMS Accountable, Accountable Health Communities, Program, Appalachian Highlands Care Network, Peer Help Recovery Program, Social Needs Council, Strong Accountable Care Community, and various others throughout the system. That's a lot of programs. <laughs> Center for Darnell RN, BSN Oncology Nurse, and longtime resident of Southwest Virginia, has served in various roles, including inpatient oncology unit nurse, nurse manager, outpatient infusion nurse, oncology clinic nurse, and most recently as an oncology nurse navigator with Ballot Health. Today, these ladies of Ballot Health are addressing breast cancer screenings in rural Virginia. Paula and Jennifer, thank you for being here. Take it away. Thank you so much, Reba, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. This is such an important topic and I'm excited to really jump in. I thought it would be great to first start by really elaborating on what our friends at the American Cancer Society started out with. And I loved that final comment that you had because it's exactly what we're trying to do in Southwest Virginia is really break down those social barriers to really be able to treat as many women, no matter what their status is, and really move upstream of this. At Ballot Health, we really think about the the barriers to cancer prevention and treatment and recovery really in three different buckets. Those really looking at those social needs, those health related social needs, such as the uh, the inability to be able to pay for services, that access piece that you were talking about. But then also scaling out one more layer, looking at that, those really social determinants of health. So thinking around things like housing insecurity and food insecurity, med rec, things like that. But then there's another layer of broad uh, barrier that comes into play, and that's things around structural determinants of health. Those are those things around political climates, systemic racism, things that you're th thinking about when we talk about social hierarchies, and they all exist. So when we're thinking about the ways to break those down, it actually has to be multi-pronged, and that's really what we're trying to do. We have so many programs that are really focusing in on getting to the most at-risk women, the most vulnerable women, to be able to provide them services in very much an equitable way. So not just a, an equal way, an equitable way. So, you know, sometimes in programming, we, we overuse the word um, equal equality instead of equity. And I love the name of this summit because it hits exactly what we're supposed to do. Instead of giving everybody the same idea, the same service and think that you're doing it because you're being equal, you're actually not creating what they need to thrive and be healthy. It is much more around equity. It has to be customized. It has to be individualized. It has to take into account not just their individual needs, but their familial needs, their community needs, and what it really needs to wrap around them at the societal level as well. And that's really what we're trying to do because when you're working in an area like we are in Southwest Virginia, there are a lot of social determinants of health and structural determinants of health at play here. And so anything that we're trying to do to best serve our women, we have to take those into account. 
one of the examples that I wanted to give before I start talking about some of the things and then turn it over to my colleague Jennifer to talk about is that really um, we have a CMS grant called the Accountable Health Communities Grant, and that really screens for health related social risk in all of our Southwest Virginia facilities. It was eye opening. Since we launched the program, we have completed over 260,000 thousand screenings coming into our facility and of those screenings there has been almost 45,000 needs identified and when you're working to serve clients and you know that they're suffering from that level of need you have to address those first to be able then to get them into a realm of self-care into a realm of prevention and that's really what we're trying to do and when you looked at those top three needs that they had it was food housing and transportation. And so being able to address those in an equitable way really helps us then to be able to serve them when we're thinking about cancer prevention and cancer treatment and recovery. And then to just further really put a fine fine tune this in is that one of the things that we dug in on was looking at transportation because we here in Southwest Virginia, we have geography barriers and many barriers around rurality. And so one of the things that we looked was around the needs and then around the assets or the capacity to address that, such as transportation. Of those thousands of transportation needs, we had just not even a dozen transportation solutions. So then we had to take things in our own hands. And so I just want to talk about one of the programs that we have going on. And that's really around the deployment of mobile strike teams, including mobile mammography. So one of the ways that we wanted to really break down that transportation barrier, that service barrier, that health related social need barrier was taking the service out to those women, getting to getting to where they are. So that way we don't have to worry about them coming to us, that we're actually working with them in their own plan of care. And so we have a mobile mem mammography unit that goes out. We partner with lots of other community providers such as others that are addressing those at-risk women or those vulnerable women, those, the, those businesses, those social service agencies, and we do a co-location of services. So not only are we able to provide mammography, but we're also able to see if they have their well checks in a place. We can look at their dental status and a number of different services. One of the other things that we have recently started to even more wrap around services for these women are really to be able to look at their health, their other health needs. So looking to see if they have those insecurities and go ahead and assign them a community navigator or a community health worker to start working with them to help address them holistically and really looking at them as a comprehensive human that has many diverse needs. So that's just one program. I'm going to pitch it over to my colleague, Jennifer, so she can talk about another way that we're doing it in Southwest Virginia. Jennifer, I'm still on mute. I do it all the time. <laughs> How's that? Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you, Paula. Um, so, um, Navigation is a service and it's provided to individuals that struggling with um, healthcare system barriers. Um, that's where um, as a nurse navigator, um, navigation's goal is to close any barrier gaps that's identified. And that means meeting the individuals where they're at in the community. Um, there are several barriers that navigation has, um, that's most common, uh, that we've helped patients with in the rural areas here is um, unreliable transportation. They um, either, they have to depend on others for transportation or they don't have a vehicle or their vehicle needs repairs. And um, we, get the community resources uh, together and it may be a uh, schedule in a transit, a uh, taxi, um, contacting their insurance company to see if transportation is a benefit for them. And these are things that a lot of patients don't know. Mm -hmm. And um, another uh, common barrier is financial difficulties, um, low income. They uh, receive multiple co-pays and 
fuel costs, going to treatments, things like that, that they're not expecting. And there's um, financial assistance that we can get set up for them. There's grants that we can reach out to. Um, just different community uh, resources, such as like Cancer Outreach Foundation here, uh, American Cancer Society, and also Susan G. Coleman. And more barriers is, of course, inadequate insurance. Um, and then, you know, we're, con we're getting them referred to social workers. Um, it may be Every Woman's Life program. If they hit us first and um, shortage of uh, support systems, patients may not have family members. And they're, you know, in this area alone. And um, also, you know, due to COVID, um, the in-person breast cancer support groups have been on hold for right now. So most of them are online. And in this area, some patients may not have access to online. Mm -hmm. So we get like American Cancer Society, the volunteers, um, as well as navigators contacting with them, talking, um, whether it's via the phone or whatever it may be. Um, and then also just lack of um, education about their diagnosis. Um, some patients has never had breast cancer. This is the first time they're going through it and uh, they don't know what to expect. So navigation's job is to help the patient and patient's family understand the diagnosis. We keep them informed of what's next and uh, coordinate all of, all of the um, appointments, all the care, you know, for them. Um, as well as, you know, helping them with other, these other needs. Well, I, I'm going to put my reporter hat back on and ask the two of you uh, a couple of questions. Tell me about your community partners. I'm sure you work with them and identifying who's most at risk. So how do you go about finding who's at risk and what's that relationship like with your community partners? Yeah, I'll tackle that one. So, you know, in working with so many community partners, you have to really form those intimate relationships. So that way, you know, it's almost that no wrong door approach that when when women that are needing services are coming into their agencies, they're familiar with us enough to have that warm handoff of referral and then vice versa. And we really have to have diverse relationships because to Jennifer's points and to what a lot of the other presenters have been talking about, there's such diverse needs from these women. It's not not just about providing them with prevention, cancer prevention services or cancer treatment. It really is holistic. So we have to work hand in glove with a number of different community providers and think to see how we don't duplicate services. How do we really work as team, how an integrated team? Mm -hmm. So when I was talking about earlier around co-locating services, that's a really good way to do it. So then that way, that woman really feels that everyone that is part of her care plan is working in tandem and in concert of one another. And I think that becomes really upstream of ever, of ever working with that client that is building those relationships throughout the community. Now, I know every case is probably different, but, but is there a, a typical pathway? So say you identify someone who's at risk and um, she goes to get screening and maybe find something suspicious. What, what's the route after that? What's the pathway? for their programs. I'll start and then I'm going to pitch it over to Jennifer since she is in the trenches doing this every day. But I will say is that so when we're out providing one of our community services, then we have a medical director, of course, so that all of these are coming through. And so if something is found that is suspicious or if there's something that's found that's definitely detected, I should say, is that then that woman is assigned a navigator. She is also assigned a care team. And then if she at this time that that was going on, we were doing a social assessment, then she's assigned someone to help her with those social pieces. So that way, her entire care plan that started right then, there will be no barriers. There's not those financial barriers. There's not those, uh, those housing or food barriers. She has a team now that will work with her from that point 
all the way through to where she is no longer suffering from a cancer diagnosis. She's passed surgery if that's what happened. And then we work with the family to also be able to see if they need services as well. I'll go ahead and pitch it over to Jennifer. So then that way she can talk more about oncology navigation with that. Okay, thank you. Um, so once the patient has a um, malignant proven uh, biopsy diagnosis and they come to oncology services, then uh, we do another screening. We, it's screening, screening, screening. We make sure, um, you know, we need to know upfront what their barriers are going to be um, so we can be working on that. So there is no delay or any um, uh, hiccup, you may say, uh, through the continuum of care. And um, at that time, we follow with the patient, we meet with the patient. We um, address all these, we refer the patient to whatever resources that's appropriate for them. And it's not that they have to go somewhere, we try to bring everything to the patient because that's, that's our goal. We want, you know, the patients already have an issue, so we want to meet the patient individual where they are. Um, so we, um, the coordinate the care. So they're not, you know, we try to alleviate as much anxiety, worrisome that we can from the patient. So we help them to coordinate the care, inform them of that. And then even through, um, survivorship. So once they've successfully completed their treatment, they will still get follow-ups and, navigation is still with them through that as well. So the, the whole journey. That is good because I know it's very overwhelming and just to help guide that patient step by step, I'm sure is just reassuring to a lot of them. So one last question for you and all the panelists talked about how COVID has played a role in all of this right now in terms of getting people to go get screened and access to that. What challenges have you had to combat where you are? in dealing with the pandemic? I think that, you know, all of us had to, had to pivot. The, the word of the year, right, is pivot. We had to pivot and really see what services we could continue on with and where we needed to make updates. For our mobile mammography, we were very lucky in that we were only off the road for a month when the pandemic hit. And that was just for us to really be able to get our processes in place around around just the precautions that we need to take, our mitigation efforts, and really to train the teams on how to operate in a COVID environment. And so, you know, we were very lucky. And I think that the other piece of that, though, is around the hesitancy to access services that have come out of COVID because of the high case count, specifically in Southwest Virginia, we have had very high transmission and case counts. And so it was around that hesitancy. So it had to be built also in a different education camp campaign and a trust campaign of it's okay to come in and get those services because just like our colleagues at ACS were talking about, we saw such a drop of service seeking during this time that we had to get really creative into building out new trust channels to get those folks in and get the services that they needed. Thank you for that. Well, you know what? Thank you to all of our panelists and everyone for joining us on Facebook Live. We're not leaving just yet. But if you enjoyed this discussion, we would like to invite you to another virtual event. The American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, ACSCAN, is hosting a Virginia Health Policy Forum, Health Equity from a Cancer Perspective on October 27th from 9 a.m. to 1030 a.m. It is free to attend, but registration is required. Innovative researchers would talk about how their research will impact the way we prevent and treat cancer in the coming years. Please register and plan to join us. Details are on the screen and available online and in our list of resources. And again, I want to thank our sponsors today. Gold sponsors is DuPont and Dominion Energy, our silver sponsors, Riverside Cancer Care Network in Humana, bronze sponsor, Carolyn Clinic, and the media sponsor, media partner, WTVR CBS 6. So at this time, we wanted to kind of open it up to questions if someone had questions to um, the panel here, but I can kick things off. And I want to go back to 
ballot health, we're talking about uh, the mobile unit going out. Uh, on average, how many breast cancer screenings are performed monthly in the mobile unit, you think? That's a great question. I would say there's ebbs and flows, right? But yeah. um, in the previous year, we did almost, uh, it was right under a thousand. And so you could, you could annualize that. But again, it just depends on the volumes at that time. I can say that one of the best pieces of that is that right at 40% are those women that are uninsured. And so, and those that have been hesitant in the fast to get that type of service. So we're really proud of that number, but around a thousand through that mechanism. And then there's some other co-location of services that we do as well, but strictly from the mobile unit is about a thousand per year. That's pretty good though, I think. And I don't know if Dr. Bellavent is on now. I see her name. I don't know if her, if she is up, if not, I'll keep going. I, I just, I just signed on. Okay. You need a moment, we'll go to another question. I'm good. <laughs> you can ask me. Well, thank you. We enjoyed your presentation. So thank you for joining us live. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. So my question for you, quite often many feel as they go through the cancer centers, um, they may feel that they're, they're hundreds of miles from their home. What does Bon Secure at Southside Medical Center offer in cancer care to those cancer patients that live locally? Wait a sec. I'm sorry. What do they offer to the patients who live locally? Yeah. So the okay. patients, yeah. Sure. I mean, I think um, the most important thing is that we have, well, one of the most important things is that we have a group of specialists from all of the areas of cancer care, including the oncologist, the radiation oncologist, and um you know, I'm a breast cancer surgeon and there are other specialized surgeons who treat some of the other cancers. Um, so the patients truly are able to receive multidisciplinary treatment. Um, I think it's very important that we review all of our cases together as a team. So we make sure that we're hitting all of the points of cancer treatment and making sure that the patients are getting the most up-to-date care. Um, and again, I think that um, what's really critical are also the support, the support systems available in terms of the different patient navigators, um, as well as um, social work and other um, areas to help patients get across any barriers that they may have in um, obtaining their treatment. Um, and certainly, um, I know that oncologists are, they also have the opportunity to participate in research and clinical trials. Um, I know certainly um, Virginia Cancer Institute has multiple breast cancer trials that are open. And those oncologists are, are very savvy at identifying patients who may be eligible and offering those options to them. Thank you, Dr. Bellavance. You know, we have another question that came in. What is the best way that community organizations and government groups can help amplify the resources available and support your work? Anybody can take that question. Um, I think in terms of supporting our work, um, one would be education of the general public in terms of um, breast cancer risk and uh, the importance of screening. And I would also say um, the importance of knowing your family history to know if you're at increased risk for developing breast cancer. Um, I think that that question is also a much larger question in terms of there are many risks for having poor outcomes in cancer that, that have to do with just our, our our baseline access to basic needs, adequate housing, adequate nutrition, um, and financial stability. And I know there's a lot that that our government could could hopefully um, help us out with that, but I, I don't have the policy training <laughs> um, to probably answer that adequately. You know, I think, Paula, you touched on this um, um, earlier, it's not just getting someone to the doctor to get screened. It's like, you have to look at this whole picture of everything that's kind of going on in their life. It's not just going to the doctor and get a screening. It's everything to get there. 
That's a, that's exactly right. You know, when we think about someone being successful in 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 their care, is that it's such this large socio-ecological model. It's all the way from the individual to that societal, and you have to hit on all those levels. And I think that there's a lot of movements though going around specifically across the Commonwealth that are really forming collaboratives around being able to address those pieces. One that I'd love to mention really quickly that is across the entire state is around the Unite Virginia movement. And what that is, is that is a electronic community referral system that is available across the entire state that is linking social service providers to healthcare systems, to faith-based organizations, to be able to do that holistic, no wrong door wraparound service provision for these women and, uh, and and their families as well. We have to all work more intimately together. And that Unite Virginia movement is, is a way that all of us can do that. And how I was talking to around that team piece, it mm-hmm. doesn't matter if you're on the clinical team or on the social team. Now there's a way that we can communicate and have a different continuum of care. And that's pretty impressive too, if all of y'all can work together like that. That's great. And Dr. Belvins, let me ask you another question. The greater Petersburg area Crater Health District is known as a hybrid of rural and urban cities and towns. What are some of the resources available for breast cancer patients or those in need of screening? Um, So in terms of the resources available for screening, um, we do have, I mean, there are several sites around the area in Emporia and at Southside Regional where patients have an opportunity for screening. I think Every Woman's Life um, is certainly helpful with the screening with the uh, under and uninsured. Um, and then in terms of coordinating the care with those patients that live further out, so this can be do this can be done by um, a couple different means. So there are some services such as genetics counseling and testing that can be provided remotely. And then the other is- I mean, the other um, component of it is working with our resources to coordinate the care that's most convenient for the patient. And this could either be us reaching out to more local providers or tailoring the care to cut down on um, how much transport is needed to get the treatment, or it could also be um, uh, finding essentially transport services for those patients. Thank you, Dr. Bella Vance. You know, I wanna ask each one of you before um, our time is winding down here is, can you kind of leave us with one takeaway, someone who may be watching us this afternoon, what is it you want them to take away when they log off? about what's going on where you are or just about the this program today. Heidi, we want to start with you. So what's one takeaway you want to leave the viewer with? I think my one takeaway is to get back to screening. It's safe and we're going to create a bigger problem than we can handle if we don't get women and men back in for their cancer screenings. <clears throat> so that's it. Just get back to screening. And it's not just breast cancer screenings either. It's all screenings, yes. Very good. Brigay, what about you? What do you want people to leave with today? Well, I'm always looking at it from the American Cancer Society lens, and I echo what um, Heidi said, but also taking individual action. So if you're a woman or a man, uh, knowing what screening you are age eligible for, first and foremost. And then if you're a younger individual, a younger adult, um, reaching out to those adults in your life, be it your parents, your grandparents, aunts and uncles, and encouraging them to screen as well. It's um, invaluable that a clinician give that messaging, but it also helps to have a family member or friend also um, suggesting, you know, hey, you turned 45, it's time for, hey, you turned 40, it's time for. Those are invaluable little pushes that help people take action. Because we do listen to people in our family sometimes. So yeah, so we would do that. I totally get it. Paula, can you, can you give us your, your final thought here? 
I've said a lot. Um, I think that if I was going to say a final thought, it would be around there's so many clinicians and community providers and family members that all have the same common agenda. And if we can really figure out how to all work together, we'll have that broader collective impact and get to where Rege and Heidi were just talking about moving upstream, focusing more on prevention and really mitigating these pieces versus having to react to them. And I think that having summits like this is exactly where we need to start and then leave here feeling activated. And I hope that that's what this has done and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Paula. Jennifer? I would like to just say that it, it starts with screening. That's the most important. Um, and the patients are not alone. They have support. We have resources to help. Whatever they feel may be a barrier that they're thinking, oh, I'm not going to go for whatever reason, put that behind you. Just go. We, we will navigate what needs that are in barriers that they have. And let me add, you're talking about navigate. How important are these nurse navigators? I mean, they are angels to me. Well, I am a nurse navigator, so <laughs> I feel like they're extremely <laughs> important. <laughs> <laughs> but um, truthfully, they can they can be your right hand. They are there for so many different um, aspects throughout you know throughout the continuum um, that they may be just a shoulder you need to just cry on. Um, they will be there for the financial needs, not only the patient, it's the family that's going through this too. So we keep, keep the whole, everything um, in mind. So that's a good point. It's not just the patient going through the diagnosis, the whole family is going through it as well. Dr. Bella Vance, what's the final thought you want to leave people with who are watching today and joining us today? Sure. Um, so when patients ask me what they can do to help themselves um, after a diagnosis, I always say the best thing you can do is advocate for yourself. So we have, we have a lot of gaps right now nationally in our health care. And I think the awareness for that is increasing. And I'm hopeful that over time as a you know, country, we'll continue to work against those. But in the meantime, in addition to having your health care providers and your navigators watching out for you, um, sometimes it's important to be the squeaky wheel and speak up if things aren't happening in a timely fashion and making sure that, you know, if your doctor was supposed to call you on Wednesday and you didn't hear from them, you need to call and, and, and remind, remind your doctor. <laughs> um, and I find that those patients who, who are also advocating for themselves and speaking up for themselves, um, I think it helps them, it helps them feel like they're taking control, but um, it's also good. It, it's good for them. Like, don't be, don't be worried about um, being impolite or, <laughs> or disrespectful <laughs> or anything like that. I mean, this is your health and, and you need to, you need to make sure people are paying attention to you. And be your own best advocate, like you said. Absolutely. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I think this has been a great conversation. And one last question, anybody can take it. Uh, what if someone who is watching, we're talking about the action, uh, we're talking about the organization or government group, but what if just the individual, what can an individual do in help with the, uh, this topic we're talking about, inequity? Be an advocate. Um, we talk, We touched on a lot of different issues that um, impact breast health um, equity here in the state. And it's one thing to advocate for yourself, but advocate for your neighbor, advocate for your community. Um, we know our communities best, so it's important. I love what Dr. Bellavant said, be that squeaky wheel, not only for yourself, but for your community too. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you again for joining us and our panelists. Thank you so much. And thank you for all of those who are watching. And thank you to our sponsors for making all this happening, the American Cancer Society for hosting our gold sponsors, DuPont and Dominion Energy, Riverside Cancer Network, our silver sponsor, and Humana, bronze sponsor, Carolyn Clinic, and the media sponsor, WTVR6. So thank you again and have a wonderful day. We appreciate it.